We're going to be reading scripture this morning from Luke 16. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe, my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who were rich lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. So he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts, for what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joan. Well, it's uh, terrific to be all here today uh, with you, and what a beautiful chapel uh, to worship and honor God. I've had friends who've come and seen your chapel and told me how wonderful it is, and so it's just a delight uh, to be here in this space of beauty uh, with you this morning. Now, Joan asked me a couple of months ago what parable I would like to preach on, and I chose this one, and I have to say, Joan was like, what? Why did you pick this one? Uh, But our passage today from the Gospel of Luke is one of those stories that I just love because it authenticates the New Testament as a historically reliable document because it is such a disturbing little story that it couldn't possibly have been fabricated by the gospel writers if they were wanting to win new followers for the Jesus movement. Make friends for yourself out of dishonest wealth? What? Say that again, Jesus? And because it is such a troubling statement, it has the ring of authenticity to it. Luke, the careful historian, reluctantly knowing how it's going to initially sound, still knew that he had to record it. What was Jesus doing praising a dishonest manager? Why did Jesus tell his listeners to emulate a man who clearly stole property not belonging to him? It's the kind of story we might prefer not to wrestle with, but I think that would be intellectually disingenuous And so it is the perfect parable to wrestle with at a theological college and a seminary. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to open it to that passage and hopefully we can have it up on the screen as well. And as with all the parables, there is a deep truth here this morning. Uh, But it's a truth uh, not just to titillate our minds, 
but it's meant to lead us to a point of decision and action. And I'm hoping this morning that we're gonna see two things. How Jesus calls us, one, to deep forgiveness, and two, broad wisdom. Deep forgiveness and broad wisdom. But before we actually dive into the scripture today, we do need to name that this parable may be the most difficult parable of Jesus's to interpret. Uh, Most often the meaning of Jesus's parables are clearer than clear. It's what makes them so compelling. You know, their simplicity and their clarity. It's like an ice cold glass of water on a muggy day. But not this time. Jesus offers a parable affirming dishonesty And then he tells us we can't serve God and money. What is going on? So as we begin, I think it's good to remind ourselves of a fundamental principle when interpreting scripture, that we always allow different passages to interpret one another. We don't read them in isolation. And so when you delve into a complex story like the one from Luke, we've got to try and find other passages on a similar theme and see if they shed any light on the murkiness. And if we keep looking through the Gospel of Luke, we're gonna discover that there are many more passages in Luke that talk about money then there are passages that talk about marriage, sex, any other hot topic. Why is that? I think the answer is pretty simple, and it's because all human beings, myself included, have a really hard time handling money. Money usually handles us. And in Luke, money is always referred to by a Greek word that is translated as unrighteous wealth or what we might call dirty money. There's just something about money that corrupts everyone. There's something about money that corrupts everyone. Cocaine always corrupts. Pornography always corrupts. A bad blood transfusion always corrupts. Luke says there's something about money that always corrupts. It's in the very nature of money. And if you look at verse 13, where Jesus says you cannot serve God on wealth, it's a fascinating verse because money here is put almost on par with God. It's quite a remarkable verse. It's almost put on par with God. It has close to that kind of power, says Luke. And we all suffer, if you like, from what I'm gonna call a money malaise, a money sickness, a money malaise. And what makes this money malaise so tricky is that we so often can't see it. Uh, We're blind to it. Earlier in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus says this, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Be on your guard, says Jesus, heads up. The premise being that the money malaise, by its very nature, is hidden. That blindness to the condition is actually part of the condition. And it's why people will come and talk to me as their pastor about their parenting problems, their addiction to porn, domestic violence, struggles with depression, grief, even their struggles with pride. But they won't come and talk to me about their money malaise. In 18 years as a pastor, I have never once had someone come to my office, sit down and say, you know, Jenny, I think I got a problem with money. I think I base my identity on the things that money can buy and my security uh, in my bank account. I've never had anybody ever come and talk to me about that. Nowhere does Jesus say, be on your guard about murder, be on your guard about adultery. I think it's pretty obvious if you're murdering someone, it's pretty obvious if you're committing adultery, right? We kind of know when it's going on, we kind of know when it's happening but we're almost never aware of the money malaise that is spread through our lives. Nobody who is greedy thinks they are greedy, nobody. We all suffer from it, and I wanna be really clear, we all suffer from it whether we have a lot of money or whether we have a little money. Whether you're in student debt or you're saving for your retirement, we are all equally afflicted. When we have a little money, 
the money malaise tends to manifest itself as worry, right? Where am I gonna get the next uh, amount of money for, for my installment, right? It manifests itself as money, uh, as worry. And if you have a lot of money, the money sickness tends to manifest itself in consumption. It's either worry or consumption. We are all afflicted. Now we're beginning to hone down on our tricky parable. And around our parable, if you read uh, around it, you will see that there's five consecutive stories about money. And it's the story that comes right after our obscure one today that I think helps us understand the passage. And it's a story I'm sure you know well. It's the story of another rich man uh, and Lazarus. And this rich man thinks he's so smart because he's planned for his economic future, right? He's got his retirement firmly in sight. He's lived life to the fullest, every gadget, holiday you could ask for. And this rich man, who's so smart, well, he ends up in hell. The rich man planned for his retirement all right, but he didn't plan for his long-term future. And therein lies his downfall. So knowing two things, one, that big picture view of how Luke talks about money, it's always dirty money, we have a money sickness. And then closer to home, uh, the story of the rich man who fails to plan for his long-term future. Now we can begin to look at that tricky parable that Joan read for us. How does Jesus call us to deep forgiveness and a broad wisdom? So the story begins with classic words. There was a rich man who had a manager. There was gossip about this manager, uh, that he was squandering his owner's assets. And it may be that the manager was simply uh, being accused of being inept and unable to make an efficient profit, or maybe the manager was abusing his expense account. Perhaps he was skimming off the top, building himself a holiday home in Egypt. We don't know. What we do know is that he was being dishonest. Verse two, what is this I hear about you, says the rich man. He then asks to see the books, and without even catching his breath, fires the manager on the spot. The scene abruptly changes, verse three, since it looks like the manager's been given two weeks notice, and he hasn't just been fired on Friday afternoon at four and told to clean out his desk. He still has some time to wrap things up. So what does he do? He's a very smart guy. He quickly realizes that he's a white collar, right? I can't dig, I'm white collar. I can't get another job as a manager because my reputation is shredded. And there's no such thing as unemployment insurance. So what to do? Well, he does something extraordinarily clever. One by one, he calls on the people who owe money to the owner and he negotiates reduced settlements. The one man owes 100 jugs of olive oil. The manager says, look, pay it now and you've only got to pay 50. And so on and so on. And while the manager clearly has no authority to do this, spin it out in your mind. What are the results for both the manager and the owner? What are the results? The debtors are gonna be eternally grateful to the manager, and they would obviously assume that the negotiation was authorized by the owner, so their opinion of the owner is gonna skyrocket as well. Which is why the owner responds in verse eight, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And here we begin to see the call of Jesus to deep forgiveness. Deep forgiveness. While it's clear that what the manager does is dishonest, let's ask ourselves the question, what precisely does he do, albeit without authorization, and with deception. What does he actually do? Sarah Dillon is an American blogger and she puts it simply like this. What the steward does is he forgives debts. The steward forgives. He forgives things he had no right to forgive. He forgives for all the wrong reasons. He forgives for personal gain. He forgives to compensate for past misconduct. 
but there is a call to deep forgiveness in this parable. Forgive it all. Forgive it now. Forgive it for any reason you want, or forgive it for no reason at all. Forgive a lot, or just forgive a little. Remember, Luke is the one who has his record of the Lord's Prayer end with, forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. The manager forgave debts. We are called to forgive debts, both moral and financial. Big debts, little debts, a lot or a little, and we don't even need a good reason to do it. And this kind of forgiveness is simply a reflection of the forgiveness that God extends to each of us because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And I think we can only be capable of this kind of reckless, maybe dishonest, reckless forgiveness because we've experienced it ourselves first. This forgiveness is free for us to give for no good reason at all because it wasn't cheap for God. It's free for us to give recklessly because it was so costly for God. And along with this call to deep, reckless forgiveness, we see Jesus yearn for us to have broad wisdom. Second half of verse eight. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than are the sons of light. The people in the marketplace, Bay Street, the hedge fund managers, the stockbrokers, are more shrewd in their dealings with earthly money than are God's sons and daughters in dealing with their eternal salvation. Then Jesus gives the kicker, verse nine. Make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it is gone, you'll be received into eternal life. Be wise, be shrewd in dealing with your eternal spiritual assets, says Jesus. As the manager in our story was wise and clever in dealing with his earthly financial assets. Or to phrase it another way, how does a follower of Jesus go about using money, which is always corrupting money, remember that, it's always corrupting, how do we go about using money and at the same time lead a life that's pleasing to God? What does this broad wisdom look like? One of the overarching themes in Luke's gospel is that the way we are wise with our spiritual assets is by using money in a way that pleases God. And for Luke, that means giving excessively and generously to the poor. You wanna please God, Jesus says? Well, one way to do it is through the right use of our material wealth. Let me illustrate. My husband and I have three young daughters. And imagine that we're going over to a friend's house for barbecue and I have our three girls with us. And in the car ride over, uh, the girls are already interrogating me as to what food they're gonna have to eat because they're hungry, right? We arrive and our friends offer us uh, drinks, we start chatting about the week, and my skirt is being tugged. Mommy, mommy, we're hungry. Shh, quiet, I said. It's rude to talk, just wait, it's rude to ask. Our friends keep chatting, the minutes keep ticking by, the drinks keep flowing, and the girls keep tugging at my skirt. Finally, my friend notices that I'm getting tenser and tenser, and says, Jenny, you know, what can I do to help you relax? You know, do you need another drink? No, 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 I say. Honestly, you want me to relax? Please, feed the kids. Just feed the kids first, okay? You want me to have a great evening? Please feed my hungry children. God is saying, you want to please me, lead a life that gives me pleasure? Then please use your money to feed my hungry children. I came across a book a few years ago by a man called Ched Myers. It has a totally awful uh, title, okay? This is the name of it the biblical vision of Sabbath economics, right? And in spite of the kind of glaze-inducing title, it's a wonderful book, and it has this wonderful image. Myers describes the principles for which the dishonest manager is congratulated 
by Jesus in terms of this. He says, Jesus asks us to keep money moving. Keep money moving. Dirty money is a resource for followers of Jesus so long as it is kept moving, so long as it is given or spent, scattered or broadcast, especially providing for God's hungry children, for those people in need, for who needs to be released from debt. The manager gets himself out of a hole by building social capital. For the dishonest manager, it took the experience of impending personal bankruptcy for him to embrace a new way of thinking about money. He says to himself, I've decided what to do so that when I'm fired, people may welcome me into their homes. And it was time for him to start squandering, to spend recklessly. It was time for him to get the money moving. What would it mean for each of us to look at our bank accounts, regardless of how much is in them, and ask ourselves, how can I keep this money, whether it's $50 or 50,000, how can I keep this money moving? Moving so that all of God's hungry children are fed. Continuing to grow and keeping our money moving is also a highly effective way of breaking the power that money can so easily have over us. Now, I want to end on a note of caution. The passage this morning is meant to lead us to a moment of decision, a, a moment of action, which is what all the parables aim to do. And we simply can't hear this story that Jesus told and give no reply. Even silence is an answer as anyone who has suffered the silent treatment from a friend or a spouse will tell you. Even silence is an answer. And if our answer is yes, to decide to continue to follow Jesus and plan for our long-term future, then we're still faced with daily decisions, uh, the relationships we form, the values we hold, and yes, the way we use our money. Will we choose to live into the future that God holds out to us, or will we rebuff it like every single one of the rich men in Luke's parables? Make no mistake, this is not a question of working our way into heaven. Eternal life is offered as a pure gift to all those who follow Jesus. God will have God's future, whether we choose to participate in it or not. The question for us, though, is do we want to participate now in a partnership with the creator of the universe in feeding God's hungry children or not? It is entirely normal for people who are in love to ask one another to do things. How can I please you? Is what lovers say to each other all the time. And it is no different within the context of the loving relationship with God that followers of Jesus are gifted with. Out of our complex parable this morning, I believe shines a challenge and a promise. The challenge, plan for your long-term future with God by keeping your money moving. And the promise, be assured, you will give great pleasure to the God who is already madly in love with you. Where you're seated, let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that you would give us eyes to see how money, a lot or a little, can corrupt us and turn us away from you. We know we cannot serve money in you. Show us how we can gain our lives by giving them away and make us ever conscious of the needs of those around us. This we pray in the name of our only Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.